Welcome to today's update. Bit of science first of all that's showing the virus survives on human skin for longer than I thought possible. Or probable anyway, so we'll look at the precise figures on that. Bit of a situation report from the United States and then a similar one from the United Kingdom. And then we'll see how we get on. There are some other things we could look at, but we'll see how we go for time. Now, the first one on the survival of the virus. Interesting new study. Survival of SARS coronavirus 2 and influenza virus on human skin. So they studied both, published on the 3rd of October, accepted manuscript, clinical infectious diseases. So this has been peer reviewed. So they wanted to find out what is the stability of SARS coronavirus 2 on human skin. And they evaluated the stability of the SARS coronavirus 2 itself, so they used the actual virus, and influenza virus A, I, A, V, influenza A virus. So they were the two viral uh, particles they were using for their experiments. And they either mixed it with culture or upper respiratory <laughs> mucus. Doesn't sound very nice, but hey-ho, that's, that's what they did. Now, the results, um, SARS coronavirus 2 became inactive in 9.4 hours. Nine point, ne nearly nine and a half hours. Quite a lot of time on, on the surface of the body. So that was interesting. Um, influenza A vaccine, 1.82 hours. So um, SARS coronavirus 2 surviving on human skin in a form where it can reproduce for much longer than influenza virus. Um, both became inactive more quickly than, or than, or than on other surfaces. So it, you know, it lasts for about SARS coronavirus 2, for example, lasts for about three days on stainless steel, glass, plastic. So surviving for much less time on human skin, but still more time than I would have thought because human skin does contain antibacterial and antiviral proteins. It probably largely depends on how clean you are, of course. The more you wash... Um, the more you're washing the natural antibacterial and antiviral properties away from the skin. They didn't account for that, but so I assume they're talking about people with normal levels of hygiene, um, nine and a half hours. And of course, at the moment, we want to wash our hands more frequently to wash the viruses off. This is the whole point. And uh, of course, this point is not escaped uh, to, to the authors. They didn't uh, fail to notice this. Uh, both became inactive in uh, 15 seconds on skin with 80% ethanol. Now, typically we have said 60% ethanol, but that's what they used. And um, they didn't mention it. It wasn't done in this study, but we do know that soap and water rapidly inactivates SARS coronavirus 2 as well. So just to conclude this little bit of science, uh, the nine hour survival of SARS coronavirus 2 on human skin uh, may increase the risk of contact transmission in comparison to influenza A virus. So, yep, that's this is their direct conclusions, thus accelerating the pandemic potentially. Um, proper hand hygiene is important to prevent the spread fairly, obviously. So there you go. Um, nine and a half hours on human skin. I thought that was rather, rather an interesting study. Now, moving on to the United States. Now, I've had so many emails about um, the reliability of data from the United States um, and um, I've been struggling with that a bit today, but I'm going to show you what I've got. I'm not saying I've come to any firm conclusions, but um, anyway, so um, I'm taking information at the moment from uh, World Meter data. Check it out for yourself. Now, basically, the figures on World Meter are somewhat higher than the figures for cases uh, and deaths published by the uh, Centre for Disease Control. Not massively high. You can tell it's the same ballpark, but nevertheless, a little bit higher. So, um, yeah. So the, ca the case is uh, plus 57,000 in the past 24 hours. Uh, and uh, World Meter is saying pretty well eight and a half million cases, whereas Centre for Disease Control is still saying about 8.1 to 8.2 million cases. So slight difference there, slight difference there. Um, recovered cases, and it's good that World Meter give recovered cases, um, five and a half million they're saying. Um, now, we believe the figure's way higher than that, but that's the official figure that they're giving. Now, new daily cases in the United States. Now, some people have been th talking about a third wave. It's, it's not really true. This is all the same wave because it hasn't gone away. So we kind of went up there. Uh, that's March, April, up again, down again. And now there's no question we are on a an upward trend again, unfortunately. That peak there in about July. So um, 
I mean, that's consistent with CDC data. The, the, num the precise numbers do vary a little bit, but not, not a huge amount. Um, you can call it an extra wave if you want, because it's a sustained increase in cases, consistent sustained increase in cases. But actually, I would call that all, all one wave, really. Whether it, well, call it what you want. It doesn't matter. The point is that there is a sustained increase in cases at the moment, which is, is, is what concerns us. Now, again, world meter, death figures, uh, an extra 422 deaths in the past 24 hours, getting up to uh, 225,000 deaths. And they, they give a graph for the new daily deaths in the United States. Um, so obviously we have the peak here went up. And there is definitely a, a trend downwards at the moment. So... OK, we know that some of these cases are going to feed through into more deaths, unfortunately. But you know, for some time now, since about the 1st of August, the trend in deaths has been downward. So um, encouraging, encouraging. Um, now, um, there's another site I've been evaluating. I'll just show you in a minute. Uh, well, th this is from NBC News uh, that th they report 733 um, thousand cases in the last two weeks so that's a substantial sum of the total uh, 8.4 million cases according to world meter data that's occurred in the past two weeks now where they're getting their data from now is this um, new app or new um, not an app it's um it's a site um covid tracking project um, now, I have had a look at this, and there's a lot of data on it, and I have I started off copying some of the data uh, to put in this report, but then I couldn't verify it, so I didn't want to put it on if I couldn't verify it. So basically, I'm wondering, is this a good site? My slight concern is it might be uh, there might be some political motivation to the site, but it certainly gives a lot of broken down uh, data. Um, on all sorts of things, cases, tests, hospitalizations, outcomes, and then it goes through all of the states. So um, in alphabetical order, which obviously we're not going to do now. Um, so um, if you if you know about these things in the states, do 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 let me know. Um, I'm interested to to realize to uh, learn more about it. Of course. Um, this is the hospitalizations in the state so we see that deaths are down and these are hospitalizations uh, and can we get the week there yeah it's always out of date of course this is the week ending the 10th of October but we see the hospitalizations are still quite low in the states indeed the trajectory is down now there could well be a bit of a pickup because this data is um, delayed of course um, but um, it's hard to reconcile what we're seeing here with this downward data in hospitalizations with what you see on news reports, which are showing <clears throat> um, hospitals struggling in many cases. So may maybe that will become clear in the next week or two. So that's the COVID tracker project. Do let me know. Now, the, the NBC News are working on this COVID symptom tracker data. have said that there's a 25% increase in 30 states and two territories in the past two weeks. That sounds about right, unfortunately. We, we know we do have this upward increase in cases. Thankfully, so far, not, at least on the official data, transposing through into hospitalizations and deaths. Although some of them will. This baked in phrase that people have been using lately. Now, they gave for, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long, but they gave states where testing rates have fallen as cases have risen in the past two weeks. Now, they did give figures, but I can't verify them. But but they're the states where they claim that uh, increase in cases, but decrease in testing. And of course, the combination of those things would mean that the actual, the actual number of cases is significantly higher than the number that have been tested. So there are areas where testing is difficult. This is the same all over the world, though. This is not a local problem. Well, it is a local problem, but it is it is a common problem all around the world, unfortunately, um, and a real problem. Um, but as we said, the, the hospitalisation data that we've just looked at, um, 
doesn't appear to be showing such a concerning trajectory. We'll keep an eye on that as soon as more data becomes available. So there you go. Um, I think what I will conclude about the United States is that the official data is it is accurate. Of course, it, it has to be. It can't be patently inaccurate. I think it's basically accurate. It, it could be delayed. Other sources of information do put the data slightly higher, but not not massively so. The discrepancy is not huge. But um, do go onto that link and tell me what you think, because I would be interested to know. Um, you know, it, it, it's just it, it's becoming confusing with with politics intruding into the pandemic. That's why I'm become a little bit cautious, really. But uh, over to you, if you're in the states, do keep me informed. Now, the UK. This is actually um, recording a bit late today, so that their figures actually from Monday, from yesterday, as are those. So that was Sunday increases in cases, Monday increase in cases, total number of officially diagnosed cases. So um, th these numbers, of course, are high and increasing. And Monday, the number of deaths. Now, OK, um, Sunday deaths do tend to be underreported. A lot of those deaths from the weekend do tend to get pushed on to Monday. So Monday can be an artificially high figure. But I must say it is disconcerting to see a figure of 241 deaths. And um, this is, this is, these are higher levels than we've seen for some time. Um, that's the deaths by people that were uh, tested and died within 28 days of testing. These are the death figures where deaths are recorded on the death certificate. And there was another 340, three of those added as of yesterday, making a total of uh, 58,000 deaths where COVID-19 was mentioned on the death certificate. So this is the death figure for people that have been tested and died within 28 days. This is the death figure for COVID-19 appearing as a significant factor on the death certificate. Now, um, information from the COVID Symptom Tracker app, which is the world's largest ongoing symptom study. Now, this, this same um, tracker app is available in the States and the United States and in Canada. It'd be good if more people used it. Um, so here, here we have it. So he, th this is saying the number of new symptomatic cases is well over 33,705, well over the, the official diagnosed cases and unfortunately just just to emphasize the nature of the increased wave in the UK at the moment that's only symptomatic people and we know that we can increase that by about 20% unfortunately for people that are asymptomatic so there's no in, in no question we're getting a, a dramatic increase in cases in the United States uh, in, in the United Kingdom well the United States as well but in the United Kingdom as we're heading into autumn or fall um, and then the, the next few months is a, is a concern, to be quite honest. Uh, active cases, according to the COVID Symptom Tracker app, over 400,000. Now, COVID Symptom Tracker app are also giving information about, um, it's very good for breaking down uh, regional cases. Now, I showed you my own area on my app the, the other day. You can break it down into small areas and see how the infection is doing, uh, the infection rates are doing in your particular area. Always very interesting. And it's highlighted the north of England. Now, this is based, the data here is based on over 13,000 antigen uh, tests from recent swabs. And uh, there's over 4 million people now giving information to the COVID Symptom Tracker app. I'm sure they don't report every day, but we're still talking about several million pieces of information. So this is good quality data. So um, this week, cases, northwest of England. Now, the northwest of England means sort of the... Uh, uh, Manchester, Liverpool area. I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm in the proper northwest. I'm even northwest of them, but it normally means the Manchester sort of Liverpool area. But the point is, a big increase in cases. Um, average of seven thousand three hundred thirteen new cases, symptomatic cases according to the COVID Symptom Tracker app per day, averaged over the, averaged over the week. Um, Northeastern Yorkshire, again. Quite a big increase. Southwest of England, much less. East of England, much less. Southeast, much less. So basically, 
at the moment we've got a bit of a, a north-south divide. The north with increasing cases, the, um, the south with many less increasing cases. Um, tier 3 restrictions. Um, talk a bit, a bit more about that in a minute. This is the highest level we have at the moment. But, but the COVID symptom tracker app saying predictions can be made up to 10 days before confirmed testing data. That is good because it's basically live time data. So it predicted that Burnley and Manchester are going to be the next places that need to go into tier three. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, next could be, unfortunately, Newcastle upon time, Nottingham, Bury, Hartlepool, Salford, Sheffield, Leeds. These are all places that could well go into um, tier three because the cases are increasing. Now, the case of Manchester and, um, well, Greater Manchester, really, um, to tell you the truth, it's embarrassing. Um, the government, it should have gone into tier three in terms of infection control days ago, arguably a week ago. Local politicians refused. It appears to me that political games are being played. I don't like it. And um, I would imagine that the local electorate in Manchester will remember this next time there's an election. Um, it's basically what's happened now is we're in the undignified situation where central government has had to impose um, tier three restrictions in the Greater Manchester area. I do hope uh, that, that despite the problems, let's say, we've had over the past week or so, that the local politicians in Manchester now engage absolutely 100% to prevent the further spread of infection in their area and that they engage with central government now pity about the week's delay not saying there's not real problems of course there are there's real economic difficult problems but i don't know if you saw the interview i did on german tv last night you know and we've talked many people have said this countries that do well in this pandemic move together as a whole and in the uk we are not and that is a problem and people will suffer as a result of that and will die as a result of that. I'll leave that there. Uh, Tim Spector has been speaking <laughs> um, about his uh, COVID symptom tracker data. Um, the data is no longer showing the exponential increase that we were seeing a couple of weeks ago. Good. It's more of a linear increase, but it's showing increase in new cases. So the, it's not increasing as rapidly. Um, Northwest, most cases... Uh, Northwest got the most cases in the UK, <clears throat> most new cases, that's hence the lockdown in Manchester. <clears throat> Liverpool, of course, is already on tier three. Doubling time of around 10 days in the Northwest region. Scotland, Wales, London, Midlands, doubling time of 14 to 28 days, much slower. And in the uh, southeast of England, relatively flat five fold fewer cases than worst hit regions so um tale of two parts of the country now hospitalizations have been one of the main things of course that people are worried about the main reason the government wanted tier three in manchester was the prediction showed that with the current rate of growth in hospitalizations and intensive care capacity particularly Basically, we would, we would have run out of capacity by about November. Uh, that means people that needed intensive care wouldn't get it. That means they would be more likely to die. Well, they would die. Um, people that needed hospitalisation may not get the hospital care that they needed. This is, this is, this is the risk. This is the, that's why I'm a bit annoyed. This is, this is what we're risking. Um, yeah, that's what we're risking. Anyway, um, hospitalisations... Um, are still behind um, cases quite a long way. But it's the trend that's worrying. So let's look at it. So this is the um, patient... Oh, that's me going on the ventilation. Here we are. Uh, patients admitted to hospital. So these are the numbers, and we, they are increasing. So this is the concern. It's not so much the number of cases. It's nothing like it was back in April, but we don't, we don't want to be anywhere near there. But it's this, this, this trend and this doubling effect that we see. Patients in hospital, UK at the moment, what have we got? With COVID-19, 5,600. 
patients, 5,648 on the past, uh, is that the past 24 hours? That, no, that's the 15th of, 16th of October. There's always a delay in this data, of course. That's the 15th of October, actually. Um, and then on uh, intensive care units, again, we see the increase. So the numbers are manageable at the moment, but certain areas like Manchester, like Wales, are at threat of not being able to cope in, in the in the week or weeks or month or two to come. And that is the concern. There's no point, this is like an oil tanker. There's no point stopping it six inches before you want to stop it. You've got to think way, way ahead. And that's, that's what's been done. And that is what's happened in Wales. Now, the, the situation in Wales is, uh, is interesting. Um, Wales, small country, left-hand side of uh, the UK. Um, population 3.3, just over 3.1 million. The R value is about the same as the UK. But the point is, um, Wales is under its own government, so it's kind of doing its own thing, which... OK, we could argue is not ideal. We have argued is not ideal. But the hospital capacity in Wales is, let's just say, we could, we could spend hours talking about this. Let's just say it's more questionable than other parts of the UK. So um, let's just say there's been problems in recent years uh, there. I'm not going to go into why that is. Um, it's outside this remit, but, but anyway. Um, so... Welsh government are talking about a short, short, sharp shock. That seems to be the phrase, short, sharp shock. I think it's a Shakespearean phrase. I don't know much about literature. And then it was made popular by Pink Floyd, of course, in my era. If you're my age group, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're young, you probably won't have a clue. Ask your mum, ask your dad, ask your granddad. They will explain it to you. Um, Friday, 6 p.m., up until the 9th of November, so it's what 16, 17 days. It's called a fire break, and basically it's a complete old-fashioned March, April style lockdown in Wales. Quite dramatic, really. Um, so 23rd of October, Friday, uh, 6 p.m. till the 9th of November, 17 days. People have to stay at home except for very limited reasons, such as exercise, work from home if possible, must not visit other households. No household mixing, indoors or outdoors. Deja vu, I'm afraid, from the lockdown in March, April. Uh, all food uh, retail outlets will be shut. Cafes, restaurants, pubs closed altogether. Takeaway only, unless they provide delivery or uh, takeaways. Um, one of the tragic things about these is it can mean that food and drinks are just wasted. Um, uh, it was it was quite sad to see all that beer being poured away in uh, in April. <clears throat> um, maybe they'll sell it as takeaways. Um, hotels, hairdressers, and beauticians will have to shut, just as in the previous lockdown. Visitors from any part of the UK not allowed into Wales without a very good reason until the 9th of November. Now this is interesting, interesting, sinister, whatever you want to call it. Basically, it means there's going to be border restrictions that are going to be policed between England and Wales. It's essentially a hard border between England and Wales, apart from essential journeys. Um, <clears throat> and, and this will be punishable. This is, it, will be, it will be an offence to travel in or to travel out without um, good reason. A bit like the Australian situation, which of course has been so successful so successful in, in Australia. We looked at Western Australia recently and the, the hard border policy there means there's been no community spread for about six months in Western Australia. But of course, regardless of what happens to the cases, um, this is going to be, uh, take, this, is, the, the, this is going to stop in the about 16 days time after Friday. Um, and that won't be enough time for the cases to start dropping off. The benefit will probably come after that. But the idea, well, we'll see what the idea is. We've got it written down in a minute. Um, schools, primary schools will be, uh, will reopen after the half term break. So there'll be primary schools and uh, preschools. Uh, secondary schools will be shut only years uh, seven and eight. So uh, 11 and 12 year olds will be in 13, 14, 15, 16, 
17, 18 year olds will not be. University students are staying put because it's a bigger risk to send them home. Um, there'll be a blended approach. Blended is a um, combination of online and face-to-face uh, uh, -face learning. Um, yep, that, we, know, we said that. First Minister Mark Drakeford has said, a time-limited five-break, short, sharp shock, turn back the clock. I don't know if you meant to rhyme there, short, sharp shock, turn back the clock. Um, slow down the virus, buy more time. <clears throat> okay, our best chance of regaining control of the virus and avoiding a much longer and damaging national lockdown. In that sense is right, the earlier you intervene the better. And this is consistent with his scientific advisors. Not that they've always been right in the past, of course, but it is consistent. Uh, without action, the NHS would be uh, un would not be able to cope. Face masks, of course. They've got way behind with the test and trace <clears throat> in Wales, so they're going to try and catch up with that. Basically, catch up a bit. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I think we'll do. Um, if you want to turn off now, that's fine. But I'm, I'm just going to do, because it illustrates kind of what we've been talking about, really. Just a quick case study from the Netherlands. Now, in the Netherlands, 13.8% um, of every 100 cases have been positive, indicating there is a lot of community transmission. And this is reflected in the new daily cases <clears throat> that we see have risen really quite dramatically in the Netherlands. But... One of the great things about the Netherlands is they provide completely bilingual data. So here is data from the Netherlands in perfect English. And uh, it gives us, again, I've, I've given you the link, all the data's there. Um, I'm not going to go through it all in detail. Fascinating data, readily available in Dutch and in English. But what grabbed me here was this is the hospitalisation rate going down. Look at the number of cases going up. Now, are these some of these going to feed through? Yes, of course they are. Sorry, cases going up. Some of these are going to feed through, of course. <clears throat> but as of the last five weeks, hospitalisation rates actually going down, decreasing. Fifteenth, sixteenth. Okay, I just thought that was interesting. So I expect hospital cases will start to go up again. But of course, the interesting question is, um, why has this happened? Why is it that cases have been going up? Hospitalizations have been going down for five days. OK, they may go up some more, but this might be the reason here. And it's the age demographic of the cases. So 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80. So these people here, we wouldn't expect to see many of them in hospital. Thankfully, these people here, we wouldn't expect to see many in hospital. In fact, these people here, we wouldn't expect to see too many. So these people here, unfortunately, we're going to see in hospital. So... Um, just that was interesting because part of the reason the fatalities were so high in the first wave were that the virus got into places like elderly care facilities. So I'm very hopeful for lower hospitalisation rates and lower uh, death rates, although there is more cases to feed through as more older people do become infected. So is there signs of hope? Yes. Um, could hospitals be overwhelmed? Well, unfortunately, yes, that's still the case. That's why this is the critical time. But um, interesting commonalities there between um, the United States with the cases, but apparently lower hospitalizations, apparently lowering death rates with the Netherlands and indeed with the UK. But we, we are at risk for the next few months is kind of the takeaway message. I know this is getting a bit tedious isn't it I mean we've been in this pandemic for a long time now but um, vaccines will be rolling out in the next few months we are kind of nearly there 
But if you're getting a bit fed up with it now, I do understand that. But we are nearly there. Okay, that's that's um, that's all for this update. Thank you for watching as always.